How is everyone? I'll try again. How is everyone? Yeah. Maps. Um, so Hank's already got the gratuitous joke about Microsoft in, so I can have to skip that. Um, how many people think Microsoft is evil? Yeah. All right, one, two, three. It's actually quite, quite few. I was expecting all the hands to go up. Um, so my name is Steve Coast, and I founded OpenStreetMap. Hi, Oliver. Hi. <laughs> Action shot. Um, I founded OpenStreetMap. I'm chairman of the foundation at the moment. Uh, I'm six foot three, what else? I don't know what else to say. I have a gift for all of you, which is why I've put this on the screen. I found this in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and they're really pretty, and they're stickers. And, and I didn't realize when I bought it quite how many stickers there are. Because there's pages and pages of these things. And there's no way I could get through them all. So I figured I'd give one to each of you. But I don't know which one to keep for myself first, because that's what I was going to do. Which is the best one, do you think? The world. That's a good one. There you go. So there should be enough for, enough for uh, one each. And you can distribute those while I'm talking. And that will distract you from all my slides that I haven't really worked on. Yeah. So if you pass those around. And just, just to be clear, it's one sticker per person, not one sheet of stickers per person. So, let's see if this explains. Am I the only one running Windows here? I only see Macintosh symbols. Um, so, an upside down map of the world. You've probably seen this before, but I really like it. It's a nice map of, uh, I think it's density of OpenStreetMap objects. And it's upside down because uh, I love Australia so much. And also because I like putting the, uh, you know, turning things upside down every now and again. Um, these are also my personal thoughts. They do not represent the foundation, my employer, our alien overlords. And I have to say that. Um, now, I wasn't sure how to start this. I've done this a few times. but. Um, there was nothing that I could think of that would be a good start for this talk. So, of course, what I did was ask people uh, on the web and on Twitter and friends about how I should start the talk, right? And when you ask people on OpenStreetMap any question, you always get a good response, right? <laughs> so after I filtered through the legal discussion, um, it came down for, to a few different ideas about how I should start this talk. Um, obviously, the first one is that it should have a lolcat in it. So there's your gratuitous lolcat. Um, perhaps it should be a corporate presentation. I could start from the beginning. A nice big Bing logo down there. Um, and then I came across this. And I just, you know, how else can you start a project with, without having an image like that being sent around the web? Um, have you all seen the video? Do you want to see the video? Yeah, I don't actually have it embedded. Um, so, Steve, if you can do that, that'd be great. Um, that was the other thing I was told to say. <laughs> but I, I thought that might be a mistake. Um, so if we start simply, I, I was sent this PDF that um, someone had produced of the graphics of the growth in the map data in Austria. And I thought, you know, where better than Austria to, to show something like that. So this is an extract from that PDF. And it really just captures everything about the project, right? It captures everything about why we're all here, what we do, what's happened. Um, you know, picture tells a thousand words. The, there were some nice graphs that went along with this about the sort of exponential uptake or, you know, I like to say exponential a lot, so let's say linear. The linear uptake in map data in Austria and how there's particular ticks when uh, Bing imagery was put into, open street, in, into editors in OpenStreetMap, which is very cool. Um, well, this is one of the other things I was sent. Now, someone told me that I don't, I don't do very well in these fights, which is quite cool, so I thought the automatic thing to do would be to fight myself, right? Because um, little known facts, I actually have a couple of different usernames. Um, and when, when I fight myself, I win, which is always good. Um, I actually don't know. There's not actually a ranking system in this, is there? Silence. I guess not. Someone should implement that by 10 minutes from now. Um, so Bing imagery, I mean, if there's one major thing since like Girona that I would have to point to, it's all that imagery that's now an open street map that has led to a big uptick in growth. You all know what that is, right? 
It's okay, you can talk. It's, we're friends here. We won't talk about Australia or the license, up until about 10 slides from now. Um, here's something that I built. Uh, this is something I think about a lot, is how can we make editing for OpenStreetMap not require a degree in GIS, right? How can we just get people to enter data simply? Um, you know, Andy had a really great one of why aren't all the text boxes in OpenStreetMap just clickable and editable? So when you're looking at a, a page for its way, why can't you just go in and edit the, the tags right there? Um, that's an obvious one to fix, right? This particular thing, all it asks you to do is drag the pin from the center of a parcel of land in the United States to the front door. And if three people do that for uh, every pin that's in there, and there's 100 million pins, so that's quite a lot of clicks, then the data is going to leak into OpenStreetMap. So to make that clear, we have addressing data and approximate locations of all those addresses for the entire United States. And we can give that to OpenStreetMap as long as enough people do these clicks. Because for various interesting reasons, I can't just dump the data in there. I can only give you the derived stuff. Um, but it's also extremely easy and addictive that you just drag that pin to the front door and it goes boom and it takes you to another one, drag it to the front door, boom, and it goes to another one, right? And I think if there's any way to increase the uptake of you know, simple types of data and getting people to contribute, it's going to be with simple little user interfaces like that that are very specific to the task at hand. Um, and that's at frontdoor.cloudapp.net, I think. Um, you've probably all seen this as well. We released this stuff, and I don't know how we can get anyone to use it, but the basic idea is that there's these two white blobs that you see on the right-hand side, and we can automatically, via magical processes, extract the, the line in between the two like that and also shift the image. Um, and that's another thing that will make life easier, but it's you know, probably trying to solve the wrong problem because if you're already excited enough to go and click on roads all day, making it 10% you know, faster is, is not gonna be any better. And what we really need is ways to just change the game and you know, get the addressing data for the entire United States into OpenStreetMap. That's the, the real thing to do. Um, we, we being, being are going to release a uh, phone application, the obligatory editor for a phone device, um, this time from Windows Phone 7. And it's actually a real pleasure to use, and it's the only uh, mobile editor I've seen so far that's using the aerial imagery, which you're all free to do, right? Um, and I've been using it for a while, and it's very cool. Well, I think the project's becoming recognized, right? If there's one, you know, despite a lot of people being at Girona or even at previous conferences, um, this project has got, got to the point where people don't just know about OpenStreetMap, um, they're also changing course because of us. I think that's the best phrase to use. Uh, I'm trying to think of a, a deeper word to use than changing course, but they respond to us maybe. So, you know, both in our dealings over the license, in uh, donations, um, in hiring people who are actively working on OpenStreetMap, um, there is basically nobody anymore who's not doing something with OpenStreetMap in some kind of deep and meaningful way, even if it's you know, a complete secret what it is that they're doing, um, which I think is, is kind of amazing, but really it's only the beginning, right? Because it's going to be the next few years as we you know, really complete countries that people are going to get uh, excited enough to just completely switch over. Um, who thinks the license process has gone well? You're on the license working group, don't know you. Okay, there's one, one person, that effectively. Uh, I think it's gone about as well as you can expect. I mean, I don't know a license process in any project that's gone well, um, unless you just hack the license to say that it's upgradable to some other license. Um, but the graph is, uh, you know, it tells quite an interesting story, um, the disparity between the two numbers and these two colors on the graph um, is quite stark. And I have a later slide about the signal to noise of what that means. Um, undoubtedly, there's been a bunch of mistakes. Undoubtedly, it's taken far longer than any of us could have ever imagined. Um, I can't even remember how many years it's been now. Does anyone know? Life's too short. You know, it's like 10% of my life. Um, <laughs> but it's almost coming to an end, I would say. Um, how long do we have left, Richard? Any day now. Right, that's the thing. And then we can all just move on and we can stop these silly arguments over pointless details. But really, you know, as we get to the point where we can talk about what's next, what next, I think, is revision two, right? We're getting to the point now where the license discussions and the, the things that um, 
are holding people back and we're talking about are things that we can just deal in version two, right? There's undoubtedly still problems with this license, right? Just as there are problems with Creative Commons. Um, and if we can just move past those and just fix the rest in version two, I think we'll all be happy and you know, the legal mailing list and talk will be split up as, as best as we can. Um, we spent a huge amount of effort, and I think it's worth noting, uh, people on the license working group spent a ton of time dealing with people like uh, NearMap and Ordnance Survey, and you know, going over every little concern, communications back and forth, liaising with lawyers, um, to get to the point where you know, we are able to use their data that they had otherwise already given, um, well, I shouldn't say given, they had always already otherwise allowed OpenStreetMap to use. Um, and you don't see the amount of time that went into that unless you're on those calls, um, but these guys spent gigantic amounts of time. And unfortunately, it doesn't always turn out the, the way you want, right? We didn't have exactly the same result with these two, as you probably know. Um, but the fact is that we, we have spent the time, and that's the important thing, right? This, this hasn't just been bounced around and forgotten about. And this big list of issues that the working group goes through every week um, only gets longer, uh, but you know, the treadmill is almost at an end. So I think most of you and I think about uh, the amount of effort that goes on in OpenStreetMap as, you know, this gigantic amount of mapping and then noise on the mailing list, right? That we care about building the tools, building the software, going out and mapping, adding roads and streets and blah, blah, blah. But in the background somewhere, there's a bunch of very angry people on certain mailing lists. But what I, what I really want to get across is when I go and do talks to people who don't know about OpenStreetMap, um, what their impression of it is when they talk to me over email or in person or whatever is the complete opposite. They see it like this, right? They think OpenStreetMap is basically 4chan with some mappers on the side, right? And that's not a very good image to have, honestly. Um, and that's why I try and work pretty hard to do things like the uh, entertaining moderation we've had uh, over the last few weeks over some of the mailing lists, is to stop us having that image and that reputation because it's very damaging for, um, for the growth of the project. There are lots of people who would otherwise join OpenStreetMap, but they see all of this stuff. And if we can, um, we should try and, I don't know, quench that fire. So if you know how, please let me know. But the, the, you know, the simplest things you can do are re reply on the mailing lists, um, go on TalkAU and deal with these people because when we're all silent, like, like we have been, and we allow these problems to get out of control, we get to the point where the project has a very negative reputation, which is completely unnecessary, um, I think. Now, we've also had a couple of forks, which is quite good. You see the fork, do you get it? Come on. I worked really hard on that one. <laughs> okay. We also have a couple of forks now. Now, the forks are really good, right? I mean, is Frederick here, by the way? No, he's not. Okay. I love Frederick's emails where he's just telling people who, you know, who are getting really angry and want to go, go and join one of the forks, like, congratulations, goodbye, have fun. Um, but it, it actually is a, a, a very good thing that we have those forks, right? It shows that the project is open to the point where these things can happen, right? Which is a big milestone. It's also a big milestone that people are passionate enough that um, they want to go and form these things, right? Just because of mere license issues. Um, it's also quite good, they're not forking over some kind of technology stack issue, even if they are slightly doing that on the side. Um, so it's important to recognize not necessarily their importance of you know, splitting the community, because I don't think that that is extremely likely, or particularly that they're going to get much data in, in the near, near to medium term, maybe. But uh, it's real proof of the success of the project, right? If you can fracture, um, it means that you've become a real open source project, I think. Um, and so they should be welcome to some degree, um, but just don't bother trying using them because I have and it didn't really work. Uh, you know, I spend a lot of time thinking also how, how can we take lessons learned from other communities? Um, like, I've got no idea why Russia has taken off and why the United States hasn't, right? And this is a nice picture of Russian data. Um, just recently, I've, I've started in. It's Belarus. Oh, I'm very sorry. <laughs> Why did you have to ruin that for me? No one would know otherwise. <laughs> Could be Japan for we you know. I don't know. Um, I'm sorry. It's got Russia in the name. <laughs> I don't know. 
But how do we take those lessons and how do we bring them somewhere else, right? So in Seattle, I've you know, tried a whole bunch of different things in the United States over a few years. And then I finally just gave up and thought, well, let's go back to the beginning. What did I do in the beginning of OpenStreetMap? Well, it's go and talk to lots of Linux user groups and run pub meetups. Right. So right now we're running these monthly pub meetups in Seattle with me and two guys, right, talking about the one freeway that we mapped this month, right, taking it all the way back to the start to try and get to the point where we would have this many people in a room in the United States, right, on a kind of you know, semi-regular basis. Um, and it's hard. And if you know the answer, please tell me. But I think, as I'll say later, it involves a lot of flying around, right? Um, it involves getting more people talking to each other from different communities to avoid these problems like the mailing lists and uh, miscommunications over the licenses and stuff. And also um, builds the kind of community that we want, right? We have a few kind of few, I'm going to call them floating super nodes. Like Richard Weir, right, is a floating super node. He just sort of, you know, descends on different countries and organizes community, right? And there's very few people that have the time and the budget and so on to be able to do that. But if we can do it on a lower scale um, between some of these places, it would have a very beneficial impact. Uh, another thing Andy said to me is that the, the servers don't just magically work, although you know, from my perspective they do, it just magically works. Um, there's a whole, ton of sh yeah, a whole ton of effort that's gone into making the servers uh, run smoothly that, again, you probably don't see very often apart from when they go down and people get angry. Um, we've moved to a second host, which is the first thing, yeah, you know, I think of it as spawning. So OpenStreetMap used to have all of its servers in one place. Now it has them in two places, which means in another three or four years, we'll have it in four places, then eight, 16, and we'll gradually take over the world with servers or something. Um, but yeah, that stuff in the background you know, takes a lot, a lot of effort um, to make it all magically work. And so if you see any of the system administrators, you should buy them a beer, and they're like sitting over there, and they should wave, shouldn't you? Yeah, buy, buy him a beer. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's fair to say beer is the, the currency of the sysadmin world. Um, the, I, th I think this is the most fantastic news we ever got. Well, perhaps. Uh, Google putting advertising all, of their, all over their maps is just awesome. Um, putting advertising even on people using the Maps API is fantastic. It's brilliant. Because so many people are now reassessing whether, you know, what map they should use, right? There's no doubt that uh, Google, you know, have a score. They just own the space of, of slippy maps to a large degree. And making all of these hundreds of thousands of people reconsider which map and, um, uh, this one's for you, Skylar, by the way. What would you call that? Red dot fever. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's the best news. People, this has really been driving a lot of people to use our maps, both in, in mobile and on the web, because we're free of all these restrictions, right? We, we looked down the road a few years ago and could see this coming. Now it's actually happening, right? Now that these guys have to make some money out of their maps, it's very helpful to us. It's going to make our community bigger. It's going to mean more publicity. It's going to be more donations. It's going to mean bigger conferences. It's all going to trickle down from there, which is pretty good. Um, I'm going to turn for most of the rest of this talk to talk about the, the foundation and what, uh, what is happening there and how it's changing. As of uh, a few months ago, the, the way the project was sort of organized from the, you know, I'm loosely going to say the organized bit of the project, which is the foundation, we had monthly, no, sorry, weekly meetings of the foundation board, um, which took a lot of time. We were meeting every month. And then that wasn't really working out because we weren't achieving very much. So we moved to meeting every two weeks, and that wasn't working out either. So of course, the logical conclusion is to double it again. So then we, we met every week, and that didn't really work out either. right? And then underneath, or in parallel, or alongside, or whatever, that we had our working groups, um, which uh, are all organized slightly differently and have their own schedule, but approximately a meeting every week or two or something. right? And that's how we were tackling problems. And so I like to think of things in terms of feedback loops and cycles. And so you can imagine that the foundation is operating on this tempo of once a week. And if all the working groups are operating on once a week, then that's a lot of man hours that are being spent for a start. And we weren't achieving a whole lot. So we decided to uh, reorganize that a little bit. And I think it was a month ago in London, we decided to go to something that looks a bit like this, but there is at least one mistake in here. 
um, Andy Robinson pointed out that our, the foundation board wasn't really being a board. It wasn't doing what it was supposed to do, in, you know, as a traditional board would. A board is not supposed to meet every week and work on operational issues, right? It's not supposed to decide license questions and run servers and, you know, pay for things or whatever. It's supposed to be there to do things like appro approve the accounts. Um, if you have a CEO, it's supposed to be there to hire and fire the CEO, and it's supposed to actually be fairly limited and provide sort of a guiding role. So. What we figured was, well, let's move the board meeting to instead of meeting every single week, why don't we make that an actual board meeting which only covers the basic issues and have that meet every six months or so, right? Maybe every three months, which is all that's required anyway legally. Then underneath that, you know, we still have to have some kind of operations. So then we would have a management meeting, which was going to be monthly, but I think it's bi weekly, right? Yeah. And beneath that, so at each management meeting, the idea is that someone from each of the working groups would show up, right? And then they would discuss anything that needs to be done, and then it can be bounced up and down. And then the working groups themselves can meet whenever they like, but that's typically something like weekly. So if you compare that to the previous situation where we had sort of both tempos were once a week, now we have the working groups which are meeting once a week. Above that, we have the management meeting which is meeting every two weeks, and then the foundation which is much more long cycle, right? Which means we're able to distribute the time of the volunteers much better, I think. Um, accomplish more and not get so bogged down in the details, right? So it means that if, if something could be handled by a working group, they can just handle it. If they need the advice or support of other, other working groups or anything like that, they can just bring it up at the management meeting, and then if it, if it needs something bigger than that, they can bounce it to the foundation every three or six months or whatever that's going to be. Um, and this is incredibly boring, but it means that we're trying stuff, right? We're trying to make this work better than it already has. And that brings me on, I think, to my next slide, is are we failing enough? Right? Come on, you can laugh. They are a real tough crowd. I mean, Barcelona was funnier than this. Come on. <laughs> Have some more licensing jokes. There we go. Um, the reorganization we've done of the foundation over the last year, not including the thing I just talked about, has basically been a failure. We, we tried multiple things, and each time it failed. Right? And it would be nice if we can fail more. I think, right? Because we need to fail more because if you're not failing, you're not innovating and you're not achieving anything, right? Um, so that's like a common theme that I like to think about through here. And now I'm going to defend, descend into the, uh, the guts of the beast. Who knows what a SWOT is? Yay, at least two people. There you go. It means strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So it was kind of a, a rough thing I did a month and a half ago around the foundation to look at what the foundation's strengths were, its weaknesses, its opportunities, and its threats. And some of them are much shorter than others, as you'll see, but we'll go through each one turn by turn. The common theme through this um, is definitely that we're completely open and it's your foundation, right? It's free to join. Um, please, we need more people to join the working groups. We need more people to uh, help write code and all that kind of stuff. We also need more people to uh, stand for election, right? And I wholeheartedly support anyone to stand for election. You should definitely do it, and you should definitely go for the chairman role because it's just so much fun day in, day out, dealing with, with uh, licensing. Um, <laughs> we definitely need to refocus a little bit on, on mappers um, and evolve as, as, I've trying to be, uh, as I've tried to evolve the structure of the foundation, we should try and evolve the structure of the rest of the project as well to deal with the problems that we're going to have today, right? Because I'll, as I'll come on to later, you know, the, the big shining standard for the world of wiki mapping is OpenStreetMap today. But tomorrow it might be Google, and I would prefer that wasn't the case, right? And we need to evolve a little bit if we're going to be able to attract the same mapping talent and man hours and time that they're able to attract. Um, some of the things I'm going to outline are just there to be provocative and get some discussion going. Um, you know, you might not like it, but that doesn't mean it's not good. Right? I'll give you a good example that I keep coming back to. I think we should have uh, an opt-out policy for mailing lists. Um, and what do I mean by that? I mean, we have, you know, the, it came up in, our, in, in a meeting at Seattle, uh, the OpenStreetMap Seattle user group, I'm going to call it from now on, that the guy said, you know, you have 400,000 users and you have all 400,000 of their email addresses. Why don't you just email them, right? Like, well, the answer is, one, that would be a big job. Someone would have to write the email. We have to write the code and so on. We have to have people to do all that stuff. But also, typically, 
I don't think we as a community are very happy just mailing 400,000 emails out because that could look like spam, right? But a lot of those people are, they, that, are, that have those email addresses, they don't feel it's spam, right? They do want to hear. They, they, they are confused why they don't hear from OpenStreetMap more than once a decade, right? And you see that a little bit in, for example, the uptick in editing that happens after the license email. Just reminding people that they had an OpenStreetMap account made people go and map more. Right. It might not be particularly efficient, but that's the kind of thing where, you know, we don't like having an opt-out system. We probably would prefer it to be an opt-in, but on average, it depends what you're trying to optimize for. If you want to optimize for more mapping, then it's probably better to have it opt-out, even if you don't like it philosophically. So, strengths. Well, this is what I think OpenStreetMap's like. It's like a fast jet flighter flying under the radar of our enemies, like our enemies, whoever they are, and loaded with weapons, which are made of maps. And I'm stretching the metaphor. But basically, we're awesome at lots of things, right? We're very, very efficient. You know, our capital expenditures are tiny. You know, it's a couple of servers, and that's it. Um, we have thousands and billions of man hours that have gone into constructing this really delicate vector graph we call a map. That's pretty efficient. Um, as I've said, we're driving force. These maps are beautiful. And you basically all know this, right? Right? <laughs> so what are our weaknesses? Um, well, we've been pretty reactive over everything that we can possibly think of. I mean, and that, that means the problems fester, right? So the best way, I think, to think about how bad some of the mailing lists have become or had become previously is that we let them become that way, right? Anyone in this room could have volunteered to be a moderator on some of those lists and stop the problem immediately, but it just means you might be told that you need to burn in hell or whatever, like that guy did. Um, but we need to be a bit more proactive if we're going to you know, solve these problems and not let them drag on for months and months or years and years, which means more people have to step up and take the kind of responsibility where you're going to get flack, right? Because we've got to the point now, which I think is another nice milestone, that the project is big enough that it's not just me being called evil, right? Now that we have more than one person being called evil, we might as well have 10 and distribute the load, right? So if anyone wants to step up for that, please do. Um, and the only way we can do that is really with man hours. And you only get new, more man hours from you know, either more volunteering time or spending less time doing something else. And there's very little way I can convince anyone to do that other than standing up here and saying that. Um, we're missing communication with a whole bunch of people for various basic reasons. Um, I'm personally going to go to Australia. And if I come back in a bodyguard, you can all be at my funeral or something. Um, really bag, I should say. Uh, we're missing them because some places are hard to get to because of the time zone or because of the flight costs and so on. I mean, there were times early in OpenStreetMap when uh, the German community and the British community weren't always exactly happy, right? And then there were a couple of times when I flew over there and met a bunch of people in person, and it just kind of solved all the issues in some ways, and they all just magically went away, or, you know, to a degree. We need to be able to do that with Australia, for example. We need a whole bunch of people to fly over there, but it's an expensive prospect, and we don't have a huge amount of money. Um, but if we were able to do that across the spectrum of communications, um, we could have a more case of, you know, community, we, we would uh, get them to map more, we would map more, we'd all learn more, and so on. Um, there's also a feeling, uh, I say there's a little bit of a split over what the foundation should be in some senses. We get, we get a fair amount of email now that say that because there's a foundation, I'm not going to do X, Y, or Z, the foundation should do it, right? Um, which is really not how it's set up at the moment, and I don't think it's going to evolve into that. Um, that's my personal you know, opinion, but there are other people who, who see it slightly differently, that definitely the foundation should be kept to an absolute minimum, and other people see that it should become this gigantic organization which basically runs the project. However, you know, even if we wanted to do that, we don't have enough people or man hours to do that, um, which means that we need more people to, sign, you know, to, to get involved and help make the project run if it's going to do so. Um, because I, I, I feel it's one of the limiting factors on the growth of things is, you know, just the volume of email that the board gets is, is I think, slightly too big for us to deal with, for example. Opportunities. Um, so my big controversial statement is we've, con we, we've, like, we've conquered the libertarian white male 18 to 55 or whatever demographic, right? You're all here or, 
you know, I, I would be extremely surprised if there was anyone at a Linux user group in the entirety of Europe who didn't know what OpenStreetMap was, right? And, and or didn't have an account and or hadn't edited something, right? But that's not the only demographic, right? So how do you keep that exponential curve going up so that we can get the better maps and so on? Well, if you've exhausted one demographic, it means you have to go and get more. So it might mean we have to get more cyclists or more hikers or you know whatever label you're going to apply to people. Um, maybe it's more 14-year-old girls on Facebook or something who are just sitting there all day tagging things. But whatever it is, you know, it, this is really a choice not for me, but for everyone in the community over whether we're going to go and try and do this or not. Because, you know, maybe we don't want the community to expand. Maybe we're perfectly happy with the kind of community we have, and we'd rather not include those kind of people. But if we are, um, then we have to make a bunch of changes, right? So as I'll say again and again, we have to respond to things like Twitter and Facebook, right? Um, each of those different groups that we might want to attract has very different ways of communicating. Some of them only like the phone, some of them like email, some of them like letters. Um, as I say, lawyers, as I've extensively dealt with, they can't deal in public forums, right? They can't give advice publicly on mailing lists, which is extremely frustrating when we're trying to deal with people asking questions. And yet, if we want their help, we have to provide interfaces to them um, and those interfaces are called working groups, and they're called those volunteer man hours that go into it. Um, if we want to get designers into the project, they don't work in committee, right? A typical designer is not going to deal very well with producing a nice design for OpenStreetMap and then posting it on the talk or dev list and then you know, getting flamed about all of his inadequacies, right? So we need to provide interfaces if we're going to be able to bring those people in to help fix you know, some of the shortcomings of the project, um, I think. So it would be nice if we had things like nicer emails, right? Anyone here could write it. We had the same discussion last year, approximately. Um, and I think we can only do it by bringing in other people in the same way that we brought in lawyers to help in some ways, right? And we should bring in designers to help in other ways. But we need more man hours. We need you to come and help make it happen. Otherwise, it's not going to. Um, as I've said, in-person in chats are probably the biggest thing we're missing right now with some chunks of the world, that there just aren't enough people who can either come here or come to Denver in a couple of months' time. Um, if we had more of those events and we had more people flying around, then that would fix a lot of things, right? How do we get to the point where I think it was, I think it was in Manchester when we first decided to pay for Steve to fly to Antigua, was that right? So how do we here today pay for someone to go to Australia and go and talk to a bunch of people and calm everything down so that they realize that we're not all evil and that we can work together and stuff, right? Um, and we need those same kind of volunteering efforts that happen to fund the server or pay for Steve to go and map Antigua. Um, for the community to work, you have to elevate it to the same level of importance, I guess is what I'm saying. Corporate membership is a little bit you know, controversial, but what I really mean by this is the, the foundation right now, um, again, because of our lack of man hours, we don't have a good way of providing you different levels of interaction with the foundation. Basically, you can be a member or you're, you know, that, that's it. It's sort of an either or choice. And we need to have a graduation that if you want to pay whatever, $10, $10 a year, that's fine. If you want to pay 100 euros a year or 1,000 or 10,000, we should have these different memberships because people are willing to pay more than we, we currently take. And then with that more money, it means we can do things like buy bigger servers or pay people to go to Australia or whatever it is. Um, so personally, I think that needs to open up in the foundation, but it's another thing that we need man hours. We need someone, a membership secretary or something, to spend more time on. Um, not necessarily meaning that we give more access to people, right? It's not like a corporation comes in and just owns the foundation. But we at least people, give people the option to spend that amount of money on the foundation should they wish to. Um, we don't even tell people thank you when they join, or you know, until recently at least, right, Hank? We try. You know, wouldn't it be great if you joined the foundation and we sent you some stickers or something, or we sent you some of those leaflets, or a t-shirt, or you know, we sent you a monthly email thanking you for your membership and giving you the news and stuff. We can't do that as a volunteer foundation without someone probably from here helping making that happen. Um, that'd be a cool thing to do, wouldn't it? Yeah. I think so. Um, I think I'm going to go to the next slide, actually, and then come back to that. I think of this stuff as a spectrum, right? So 
we have different ways of communicating with people, and we're really good at some of them, and we're really bad at others, right? So amongst the spectrum, there are things like IRC, email, mailing lists, face-to-face -face chats, phone calls, right? Um, and this was a slide I made a little while ago, and the, you know, the, the brightness of the color represents how good my, off the top of my head, you know, finger in the air was that how good we are at it, right? So the mailing lists, are we good at them? Yes, there's lots of mails and people respond and people read it. Um, the forums are very, very good now. Uh, the help system is very, very good. I've only got five minutes. I demand more time. No, no, I'm joking. But we're extremely bad at things like social networks, right? One thing I keep on getting asked at talks um, around the US is why don't we respond to Twitter and Facebook very well? Um, and we, we just don't really have the right people for it right now. We don't have those interfaces to make that happen, right? Um, how do we make it happen? I don't know. You know, one stab in the air is that, you know, if we have a common, we, ha we already have a Twitter account, right? And all it essentially does is it retweets stuff that goes to open geodata, which you're all welcome to join and post to, by the way. Um, and a few people have the password to it. But we need a more systematized way of dealing with this, right? There are people asking questions, how do I do X, Y, or Z on OpenStreetMap on Twitter, and we don't respond to them, right? It's like, you know, if a tree falls in the forest and no one's there to hear it, does it make a sound? Well, these, these guys uh, do want help. There are people who want help getting started in mapping, and we're not providing the, the tools that they need to get it, right? So, you know, we need a better, is it? we need a, a smoother spectrum of communication that, that in the same way that we're good at IRC or mailing lists, we should also be good at Twitter and Facebook, I think. Um, Owl's a great example. I mean, Owl's a fantastic tool, right? And that's the kind of thing that if you have infinite amounts of coding time that you should just be able to hook that up to your account and just automatically be told when stuff is happening near you, right? That's another thing I repeatedly get asked is, right, I signed up for my account, I added my house, why aren't, why aren't I told when stuff happens automatically, right? Well, it's because it's a hard problem and we need the man hours to do it. Um, threats. Who knows what that means? It's a tank on your lawn, right? The biggest threat, of course, is MapMaker, I think. Um, it's a fantastically good tool. It's easy to use. It's nice. And people are flocking to it. If you look at the, the user growth of, of that tool and the amount of map data, it's fantastic. It's awesome. And we should be that good. There's no reason why we shouldn't be, right? And so that's usually you know, my bellwether thing to think about, about uh, are we performing against them? And today, we are, right? Um, but I don't want to get to the point where you know, they have all the credit because it would only require them to switch licensing, which they could do at any moment. And suddenly, you know, th there's two ways to look at that. One, it means we've achieved our goals. Now we have an open map if they were to switch licensing. But on, on the other hand, it'd be nice if, if uh, we were big enough to force them to do that because it made them look absurd or whatever, uh, I think. So there's no reason why we can't be as good at these things as we are as the other things, right? It just requires time. Where do we get the time from? Well, the time comes from you, or it comes from paying people, basically, right? How do we evolve to the point where we can make better use of that time? I don't know, but we've been trying, right? So we've been trying with the structure of the foundation. I've been trying with the things I do in the United States, where I spend my time on community stuff. Is it just imports, right? Or is it going to every single Linux user group in the United States, right? It's those kinds of things that we need to think about in depth uh, if we're gonna make these transitions. And you can think of the foundation as just taking care of the market failures, right? Our market failures are things like someone has to step up and moderate the mailing lists, right? Or, you know, the, the community, we, we need someone to uh, hold the centralized keys to, the, you know, the login to change the DNS names, right? We have to have those kinds of things held by a centralized authority but not have it become so big that it takes over and runs the project, still supports it, but where we have enough time to fix these problems. So, please spend more time doing so. And I'm gonna end on this slide, because I think it's just amazing, right? It, this is the, to me, this is the, the modern example of OpenStreetMap. The last one I used to use repeatedly was always Haiti, right? And people always think Haiti is a great example of OpenStreetMap, and of course it is. But being the first map on the web, or really anywhere, to have a new country on it before anyone else. This is South Sudan, if you haven't guessed. I got South Sudan right. It's not Belarus accidentally, is it? No. <laughs> you never know. It, it is actually hard when you, you, know, you don't read Arabic and stuff. Um, but this is now my bellwether thing. This is what I tell people about, is that we're the first people to have South Sudan, right? 
it might not be 100% accurate, it's better than anyone else in the world, right? And that really shows the, the power of the project um, in addition to things like Haiti and stuff. So thank you very much for all your time, guys.